All right, we're into part three of Get Help, Give Help. This session right now, I believe, is going to profoundly touch your life. It's touching my life, Jesus, even as I meditate on the scriptures of this, this whole theme today. Get Help, Give Help, part three. Now, here's what we've learned so far. Everybody needs to get help. Everybody, no exclusions. Everybody has a purpose to give help. That's what our purpose is ultimately, is to be able to give help. Jesus instructed every one of us to ask and receive, seek and find, knock, and it's open up to us. Matthew 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be open to you. We've learned that you have to ask the right people to get the right questions answered. That's our part. Jesus, the son of almighty God, he pursued the right people. Remember that in Luke chapter two, he pursued the right people in the right place and with the right questions. Luke two, verse 49, he says to his parents, Jesus said to him, he said, why did you have to look for me? Explain that to me. Did you not know that I had to be? Remember that? I had to be in my father's house. Did you not know that? Jesus said, I had to be. And we ask the question, where do you have to be? Do you know? If you're still stuck in the same sadness as a year ago, do you know where you have to be so that you can move out of that? If you're stuck in the same relationship problems as a year ago, you got to ask the question like Jesus did. Do you not know I have to be? you got to be in so that you can get out of the trouble. If you're still stuck in the same bad habits as a year ago, it means you got to get into the right relationships, the right mentoring relationships so you can get out of the mess. If you're still stuck in the same financial problems as a year ago, that means you got to get in with the right counselors, the right advisors, so you can get out of the mess. No condemnation. Never let condemnation lead you when you're talking about the Word of God. Don't feel condemned. Don't let that come in. It's okay to be convicted. I'm convicted all the time when I'm reading God's Word because God, God's Word will correct us. I feel like I'm moving this way, and if I'm hitting a brick wall, if I'm hitting the same place, the same place of resistance, then I'm looking for God's correction to have Him say, Stephen, turn this way. There you go. See, it's easier on my nose. I'm not running into that brick wall anymore. But correction is a good thing. But you never want to get into condemnation, beating up on yourself. There's no profit in that. And God would never want it. Jesus said, I have not come to condemn the world, but to give the world life. He came to give us the answer, the solution. But it's important that you be honest with yourself. You're not stuck because God wants you stuck. Right, The moment you start building a doctrine around being stuck, you're really going to get stuck. You're not stuck because it's God's will for you to be stuck. I've talked to people that they were like, well, Pastor Stephen, I've been 30 years in this wilderness stuck because I believe the Lord's trying to teach me. You know, like Just like the children of Israel, it should have only taken 11 days to get across the wilderness. It took 40 years because they were stuck in their unbelief. Unbelief yields stuckness, right? You're stuck because you're not doing what even Jesus did in recognizing that you have to be. Remember, Jesus said, I had to be. Mom and dad, did you not know I had to be? Have to be what? You have to be in the right place with the right people asking the right questions, period. There's no way around that. And again, if Jesus had to do that, right? You don't think you're better than Jesus, do you? Of course not. You're smarter than that. You're way too smart for that. Therefore, if Jesus had to be in the right place with the right people, then so do you. So do I. We have to be in the right place with the right people. Praise God, we just answered why you've been feeling stuck. No condemnation, right? Why your marriage seems stuck. Don't be condemned. See, there's people that think, well, I'm, I'm just a bad husband or I'm a bad wife. I'm just, I'm just bad at marriage. No, you're not. It's just you're the right person that needs to be in the right place, just like Jesus, or else the whole thing doesn't work. Right, The cogs in the wheel, they don't fit in with the gears. They won't work unless you're put in the right place. You've got to be with the right advisors. The moment your marriage is um, independent of wise counsel, no matter how right your marriage is, it is going to fail. 
So see, there's no condemnation. Quit beating up on yourself and thinking you're a bad husband or a bad wife or a bad mom or a bad dad or a bad son. You're not. You just need to get with the right people, the right counsel, and get rid of all the wrong counsel in your life. You need to get help. Just like me, just like Jesus, we all need to get help. Not just any help. You need qualified help like Jesus got. So that leads me to this. Let's talk about your wants and your needs, what you want and what you need. Both of these are so important in your life. They're, your wants and your needs are a little bit like gauges on the dashboard of your life. They tell you where you're at. They're important. It's important to know what you want and what you need. Don't get religious on me and get into self-denial and saying, well, I, I don't want anything and I don't need anything. That's not true. God made you to have wants and then made you to have de- um, needs. So they're gauges. So let's look at them. As your character develops, your wants and your needs testify to that very fact how important they are. It's kind of like someone who has never exercised before, right? Somebody who's never, you know, I know that feeling. I kind of go through those seasons. You've, You've never exercised in a long time or you've never exercised before. And when you start, you probably feel like you want to stop. But we know you need to keep going. Right. You get there's the gauges. The gauges are way high. I want to stop. But, you know, your need is like down here. So you need to get them balanced as you get in shape and you start getting stronger. Then you may now feel like you want to push the limits, push it even harder and push yourself even more. But then there's this breaking point where, you know, you have to be wise and you need to stop. You need to get rest, even slow down. I've got friends of mine who are in amazing shape, but they've got to balance their wants and needs because they want to push themselves even harder, but they could hurt themselves physically. So you got to balance those wants and needs. The challenges that many of us struggle with is the order of want and need. Too often we put wants ahead of needs. You can't put your want gauge ahead of your need gauge. You may want a hamburger right now, but your body may need a kale salad. (laughs) You may want to get married right now, but you may need relationship training first. I advise all couples who want to get married, you need to get counsel first. You may, you may want to get on the other side of the covenant, but you need to first get the wisdom on how to fly the plane. You may want to be the one that leads. You may want to be a boss. That's good. If you want to have a desire to be a leader, to be a boss, to be a manager, to be the head of something, you may want that, but you may need to learn how to follow first so you can get credibility. You may want to be a millionaire. I have no problem with that. If that's if God's put a desire in your heart to want to be good with money, you may want to be a millionaire, but you may need how to learn how to be first a hundred heir. You know what that is, right? Somebody that knows how to steward a hundred dollars before you become a millionaire. You may want a vacation. And there's nothing wrong with vacations. But first, you may need to learn an assignment that you hate to vacate. You know what? There are so many people that use vacations as a tool to escape life. That's not what they're meant for. God's got better for you, and it starts with getting wisdom, and that's how you get help. Too often, people pursue some short-circuit gain for a life of long-term pain. Can I say that again? Too often people pursue some short-term gain for a life of long-term pain. That's called consumerism. When getting help prioritizes the wants over your needs. Getting what you want and need in the right order can make it so that your wants and needs work for you and not against you. You can harness them to work for you. Those gauges on the dash of life should work for you, not against you. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. What? Are you kidding me? Come on, Stephen. Prove that. I'm so, see, I'm glad you're asking these questions. These are good. Good question. Matthew 6, 26, verse 39. Jesus talking, and he says this, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, not what I want, not what I desire, but as you will and desire. Oh my goodness. Did that just blow you up, right? Is that not amazing? Jesus 
didn't want to do this, but Jesus needed to do this. He said, Father, I don't want it. This is not my desire. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this suffering. But if I need to, not what I want, but Father God, what your will requires, what you need me to do. Notice who helped Jesus differentiate between want and need. His father, a spiritual father. Not Joseph, but a spiritual father. The father of all fathers, yes. Because ultimately, any spiritual father will give, in you, will give you heavenly father's advice. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, okay? Who is the leader and the source of our faith and also its finisher. For he, for the joy that was set before him, look at this, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame. Jesus had to despise and ignore the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Further proof that Jesus did the hard stuff for the long game. Jesus was playing the long game and not the short game. Come back to too often people pursue some short-term gain for a life of long-term pain. Imagine if Jesus had pursued the short-term gain of avoiding the cross. He would have avoided all that suffering, but he would have never brought us into his long-term blessing. We would have been forever damned. We would have been forever lost, eternally lost. But Jesus, he put his, the needs of Father God to be in family with us over his own wants of the moment. I'm telling you, Jesus modeled so many amazing things for us. He modeled the ultimate of doing what was needed so he could get what he wanted, which is you and me in the family of God. Jesus wanted you and me in the family of God. That's why he said, Father, if there's no other way, I, I'm going to have to drink. If there's, if there's any other way, let's this cup pass. I don't want to do this. But if there's no other way, I've got to do it. I need to do this. Jesus expressed to the Father, I don't want to do this. But if there's another way, short-term pain for long-term gain. So that leads me to this. Let's talk about your core competencies. This is such a big thing in the realm of the spirit. Spiritual fathering and mentoring help us develop our core competencies. You know, our, our skills, our disciplines. These are the things, the disciplines that mark you as a true disciple. It's who you are. Paul wrote to the Galatians and called them fruits or byproducts of the spirit. Look at Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us, is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. That's good. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. My friend, never confuse gifts with character. That's dangerous. Someone may have even a ministry gift. Don't confuse the ministry gift with character. Gifts are given. They're free. They cost you nothing. But character costs you everything. And it's who you are. You're defined ultimately by your character, not your gifts. Gifts are what you do. Character relates to who you are. We all must develop core competencies. Delayed gratification is part of our life of faith. What's that mean? It means we ask, then we receive. We sow, then we reap. We don't walk by feelings or senses, but by faith, confidence in God's word, regardless of what we feel. I got to pray with somebody, a dear saint the other day, and she was experiencing extreme pain. We prayed for a better outcome. In the moment we were praying, she didn't feel better, but we believe God and God was involved in the situation. There was the, the present pain, but we were believing for the deliverance. And that's what faith does. Faith speaks of things to come, not, not what we see or feel or experience, but we thank God for the healing to come. But, oh, Pastor Stephen, I'm under the law of grace and all that order stuff. You know, that, that, that doesn't matter to me. That, that doesn't matter. Listen, God is a God of order. He never changes. 
Yes, he gives you grace, but it's not a license to disregard his order. His grace is to help you do what you couldn't do in yourself. His grace is to help you to obey, to submit, to distinguish between good counsel and bad counsel. Grace to get help. You see, we need grace to get help. Otherwise, we stay locked in our pride. I remember there was a preacher telling one time about a, a family. They were on the poor side of the tracks living outside of town. They were just so poor and they needed so much help. And finally, the pastor heard about some, some dire circumstances in the family. And he came up to the man, the father, and he said, Sir, he says, what? Why didn't you ask for help? Why didn't you reach out? Like, you guys obviously need a little bit of food. Like, why didn't you ask for help? The man said, well, he says, you know, we don't have much, but we got our pride. You see, that's what grace is for, to deliver you of pride. Don't you know in Proverbs 6 that there are six things that God hates, and the number one thing is pride. God hates pride, but see, we have built into our culture that somehow that pride is an equity, that it's a good thing to have. No, Jesus came to deliver us of sin and pride is at the front of the line. We need deliverance. We need grace to be able to even ask for help. Never believe the lie that grace is somehow license to sin, license to remain the same. Somehow it's a license to stay broken. Somehow that grace is a license just to, you know, well, this is the way God found me. I'm just going to, yeah, God found you that way, but he doesn't want to leave you that way. Grace is meaning it's empowerment, undeserved fa favor and merit to not stay the same, but to get help. Grace is not a license to do whatever your flesh wants. Grace is not a license to not be accountable, to not grow. Grace is not a license and an excuse that says that you don't have to grow. Grace is empowerment to grow. Grace is not a license to be a spiritual brat. No, no, no. Grace is a call to wake up and to get strong, to grow up, to come out of your dysfunction and step into accountability, and being part of the family of God. Grace is something we all need. It's empowerment to live right, to live strong, to grow. Grace, to change, to transform. God's unmerited favor, wow, is to be called his child and to act like his child. See, I don't want to just be called a child of God. I want to act like a child of God. And that's what God's amazing grace is for, to help me act like I could never act on my own. It's undeserved strength to not stay the same and live illegitimate. I don't want to live illegitimate like Galatians talks about. I want to be, if we're a child of God, that means that we're not immune from or exempt from correction. God, those sons and daughters that he loves, he corrects. He doesn't leave them the same. Praise God for that. God's grace to get help in time of need. Mm. And the golden key to unlock that help is the power of the ask. Seriously, do you know how many lose out on God's help because they refuse to ask? A refusal to ask is basically just pride. There's an old saying that says that if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. God wants to give you all the tools in the toolbox, not He's provided everything, but not having the tools and just having a hammer and going through life banging at everything doesn't mean that you've got the right answer. God wants to give you diversity. He wants to give you a broad range of counselors, of advice, of spiritual fathers so that you can have everything that you need. God is unlimited in his resource of tools, solutions, weapons, and of course, wisdom. But you must ask and ask a qualified spiritual mentor. Ask, seek, and knock. Real fathers take their directions from the Father of lights, James 1.17 says, right? The Father of lights in whom every good and perfect gift comes down from, and there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. Spiritual fathers, I'm talking real fathers. In the last session, part two, we talked about the who, right? Mentors and advisors. I want to talk about that now. The role of physical fathering is but a reflection of what it means to truly spiritual father. The real instinct of fathering. 
to spiritually father is as much about taking away the bad as it is about adding the good. You know, Pam and I, when we were living down in Nashville, at the front of our house, we had these two pillars. And a lot of times it seemed like the robins loved to get on top of those pillars and make nests. I think it was because there was a little covering outside of the rain. Pam and I would joke that they were finding the best condo in Brentwood where they could live. And so I would take advantage when their little babies would start hatch. I would take a camera and I'd take pictures of that process. And one day I was watching the 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 parents coming in there feeding the, the little babies. And I noticed they would feed their little, they put the food in their mouths and then their head would go down, something, doing something in a nest. And then they would fly away. And I'm thinking, what are they doing? And I noticed when I took pictures, there was never any bird droppings in the nest. Never. I'm thinking, what is going on here? Like, I mean, those birds can't just be eating food and it going nowhere. And so I looked up online, and did you know that there's such a thing called a fecal sac? And what happens is when the mother or the father bird feeds the little baby, it prompts them to drop their little diaper. And what it is, it's like a little sac that comes out, and it's got a membrane around it, like a little diaper. And so when the mother or father feeds the baby, the baby drops its little diaper, so the mother or the father knows, feed, and then grab the poopy diaper. And then that's what they drop on my car, right? That's what they drop on your car, the fecal sac. So every time you see that big white splash on your windshield, you'll know what it is. Like You can be like, my goodness, another fecal sac. But I'm telling you this because in spiritual parenting, it's as much about taking away the bad as it is about adding the good. The role of fathering or spiritually fathering in the Bible sense is to put the right seed into the right ground. But you can't allow the weeds to grow around too. That's part of cultivating the ground. And it's not a gender thing. Many great leaders are women who sow kingdom of God seed into protégés' lives. So what do I mean by right seed? Well, one of the top seeds is wisdom. Ecclesiastes 10.10 says, Wisdom helps to succeed. Wisdom is profitable to direct. The next great seed I think of is understanding. Psalm 119 verse 130 says, God, your words give light. Their unfolding give understanding. Proverbs says, Get wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding. Bible talks about getting the seed of knowledge. In Hosea 4, 6, God said, My people, they perish, they're destroyed, they're, they die because of a lack of, a lack of knowledge. The Bible talks about the right seed of direction. Proverbs 3, verse 6, God will direct and make plain and straight your paths. Oh my goodness, direction. If you've ever been lost, right, you know how valuable wonderful direction is because I mean it just it gets you to your destination and if you're really lost in a big city or something it can be actually scary direction brings that protection which leads me to correction what a wonderful seed see a lot of times we think of correction as being bad because if you've had a poor mentor or a poor advisor or a teacher who doesn't know how to apply correction, it doesn't seem like a good thing. But, you know, biblically, correction should gladden your heart. It should make you happy because now you're not going to keep banging into the same wall. You're going to get correction. Proverbs 13 verse 1 says, A wise son, a wise daughter, heeds their father's correction. Hebrews 12 verse 7 says, God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom father does not thus train and correct and discipline? Here's another wonderful seed that follows correction. Affirmation. In Matthew 25 verse 23, we hear Jesus speak the words, Well done. You upright, honorable, and faithful servant. You've been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of much. There's a reward, the affirmation of a spiritual father. Here's another good one. Praise. Did you know that we're allowed to use praise with one another? 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another, edify, strengthen, and build up one another just as you are doing. Psalm 22 verse 3 says, God inhabits the praises of His people. That's not just praise for God. You see, you're made in the image of God. And Psalm 100 says that we're to come into God's presence with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. 
Because you're made in the image of God, you have the same protocol being made in God's image. I'm telling you, if you want your marriage, quick fix, if you want your marriage to start working better than you've ever had it work in your life, start using thankfulness with each other to enter each other's gates. And if you want to get into each other's courts, amp it up and start using praise. I mean, authentic thankfulness and authentic praise. Beautiful seeds. And of course, love. Love is a wonderful seed. It's the most powerful seed. The Hebrew word picture for love is three letters, and it means the heart of the Father revealed. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says this, Faith, hope, and love, these three, they abide together, but the greatest is love. Spiritual fathers and mentors, they know how to identify seed and ground. What seed for what ground? I can tell your future and it's not something super spiritual or a great gift. I've just learned as a leader to identify seed and identify ground. Basically, I know what you're sowing so I know where you're going. Now, I know some people, when they hear that, they're like, that, that's, just, that, that's offensive. You don't know where I'm going. You don't know me. You don't know where I'm going. Look, all of life comes under Galatians 6, 7. God says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man, whatever a woman sows, that and that only is what they'll reap. So, my friend, I know you may not, it may irritate you. It may irritate your belief system. It may even convict you. But I do know where you're going. If I know your seed and I know the ground you're sowing in, yes, I can tell your future. And I've done it many times to the frustration of some people, but they walk right into it because the thing is, it's the law of life, seed, time, and harvest. And people find that offensive. They go, the audacity. How can he know where we're going? Only God knows where we're going. Well, that's not true. Even demons and angels know where you're going because for thousands of years, they've just watched mankind sow this seed into this ground and they know what's coming. Your seed is like a declaration of things to come, where you're going. If you're a farmer and you sow turnips in the spring, will you be reaping wheat that fall? Look, I'm not even an agricultural wizard, and I know the answer is no. And you know it too. Deep in your heart, you know it too. If a farmer sows turnips in the spring, will he be reaping wheat in the fall? Absolutely not. You see, it's already predetermined. And so, see, you're telling the future. You know that field, it's going to be turnips. It's not going to be wheat. You're telling the future. And yet, we have so many Christians with selective outrage about things in the world, but completely unwilling to change themselves, change the seed that they're sowing. See, you have delegated authority over the seed that you sow. Not what she sows, not what he sows. You know, I don't have delegated authority over the seed that Pam sows. That's between her and God. You know, I can encourage her as her husband, but that's between her and God. You have delegated authority over the seed that you sow for your life, and you're accountable to God for what you sow. So let God's word change, transform you and doing that, and God will have access to your world. See, if you really want to change the world, right now there's just such an upheaval. Everybody's chanting and wanting to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. Start with you. Change you. Let's me and you make a commitment to focus on God's word and change us. I need to focus on changing me. If I let God's word change me and I start sowing the right seeds, then God have, has access to this world to change the world. It's a distraction ploy of the enemy to get us all focused on one another, trying to get everybody to change everybody. You're not going to fix any problem. It's going to be an exercise in futility. Change you. How do you do that? Begin consulting with the Lord and sowing the seed he's called you to see. So into the ground he's given you to sow into. Get the right mentors, the right instructors, the right teachers, the right spiritual fathers, and let them help you know what seed to sow into what ground. Let's summarize and apply what we've learned. The next session we're going to have, we're going to have real people asking real um, questions and we're going to try to give them answers and help and apply this. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be kind of like a little bit like let's ask 
Pastor Stephen type of, type of thing. You know, I think it's going to be exciting. I think we're going to get real people and we're going to apply all these principles to giving real instruction, real correction, real advice, real answers, real help, get help and give help, right? But remember, everybody needs help. I need help. You need help. Jesus got help. Only wise people ask for help. So let's do this quick review. Number one, you need to pursue access to qualified mentors in your life, a spiritual father. Every one of us, we need to pursue access to qualified members. Number two, you need to ask the right questions. You need to be able to differentiate between want and need. That's a big part of it. And a lot of times a spiritual father has to help you with that, has to help you choose between the hamburger and the kale salad, right? Choose between exercising and resting. And number three, you need to develop your character more than your gifts. You need to develop your core competencies. Number four, spiritual fathers sow the right seeds. If you're going to have that qualified mentor, do you even know how to identify good seed? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, correction, affirmation, all those good things that go together in the right order. And then number five, honesty. You have, you have a harvest coming. Every one of us have a harvest coming right now. So are you going to be honest about the future or are you going to practice being deceived and being deluded? Galatians 6, 7, right? Don't be deceived, God says. God is not mocked whatsoever a man or whatsoever a woman sows. That and that only is what they're going to reap. And number six, change the world by changing you, period. Stop being distracted. Yes, the whole world needs to repent. It's true. But you only have delegated authority over you. Quit with the outrage and employ grace today to change you. When you change you, you affect the whole world for good. And God has access to his kingdom coming, his will being done here on earth. Right? Isn't that beautiful? And my friend, right now, if you want to start with you, the greatest thing you can do is invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. King Jesus, there's no better seed to go into the ground of your heart than a relationship with King Jesus, His Lordship over you. And here's how you pray. Just pray this with me. It's so easy. Jesus, here I am. Just say this. I need help. I need to be saved. And I need to be discipled. You're the only one who has died on a cross for me, rose up from the grave. My hope is in you. Forgive me of all of my sins. Help me now find the right mentors. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Come into my heart. Now I'm a child of God. I belong to the family of God. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. 